good afternoon and thank you for inviting me. I want to talk to you about Gaussian processes, uh, why they're fun and how they uh, help us building probabilistic machine learning models for the real world. And first uh, about me, uh, my name is T and um, I'm a senior machine learning researcher at Second Mind. Uh, we recently rebranded previously, we are known as Prowler.io. And I screwed up at some last minute, thanks to the slides. Um, I did my PhD in physics and then started moving more towards the holistic modeling side of things. And I'm now at the startup in Cambridge where we build decision making systems. And uh, about the talk as an overview, first I want to uh, give you some context and motivation about why we do probabilistic modeling within our company and why we use Gaussian processes. And I don't know how many of you are already familiar with Gaussian processes or GPs, but if you want to write that in the, in the chat, I'd be really curious to read, read that through that afterwards. And um, for those of you who are not that familiar with Gaussian processes, I'm going to give a brief introduction. And for those of you who do already, no, I hope you won't mind the recap. At least there'll be some pretty pictures. And once I've got all of that out of the way, I want to spend the rest of the talk talking about uh, how we can make GPs more practical. Now, if you've got any kind of short questions of understanding, I'd be happy to take them throughout just to make sure we don't lose anyone. And otherwise, I'm also happy to stick around afterwards for uh, discussion and chat at the end. So first with some context. At Second Mind, uh, we want to build automated decision-making systems. And what do we mean by that? Um, we base that on statistical decision theory. And um, that's basically about finding uh, what, out, what action to take next. And we don't want to just take any action, we want to take the best action. And what does best mean? Well, we want, we need to specify some kind of reward function that we want to maximize. And um, in any interaction uh, with, with a system or the real world, the reward doesn't depend just on the actions that we choose to take ourselves. It also depends on everything else that we just summarize in the state S. And Crucially, we don't actually know what the state is going to be exactly. All we can hope for is build some kind of model uh, over the state, and then we can try and uh, maximize the expected reward under our kind of model belief over the state. And this model um, depends both on data, kind of like observations that we want to use to learn from uh, what's going on in the world and then our model definition. And in our company, we ap uh, apply this in three different uh, directions, Bayesian optimization, model-based reinforcement learning and stochastic network control. And that's literally all I'm gonna say about that. And the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on the probabilistic modeling that feeds into the decision-making. Now for probabilistic modeling, I'm going to focus on functional relationships between some inputs and some outputs. This can be classical regression, but the inputs don't have to be real numbers. They, they can be many things. And the outputs also can be many different things as well. And I'm going to talk about um, what these things might be later in the talk. And uh, why, why, why do we care about this functional relationship? Well, really, we want to make a prediction of what's going to happen um, at a new, new input point. And so we say, okay, there must be some kind of functional relationship that 
kind of relates the inputs to the outputs. And what we want to get out of the probabilistic model in some sense is this conditional of the function value at a new point, given what we know about the relation before. And I put this in quotes because this is a bit hand wavy. And I'm going to also talk about this kind of observation model that relates the function and x and y later in this talk. Now, how do we actually um, figure out what f looks like? Um, we use Bayes' theorem for that. I guess no talk about probabilistic modeling would be complete without at least one mention of that. So here's my take. Um, and I'm assuming lots of you are very familiar with this already. But just in case you're not, it's about uh, relating the parameters of some kind of model um, with the data that we observe. And so Bayes' theorem gives us the posterior of the parameters given the data that we've seen um, through combining the likelihood of the data given the parameters and the prior belief of what are these what should these parameters typically look like. And then they're normalized by the kind of slightly confusing probability of the data, which is also known as the evidence of the marginal likelihood. And that part uh, is less confusing if you're a bit more explicit about what we're actually doing, which is we also have to condition on the model uh, that our parameters are part of. And then um, I'll also briefly cut, get into more detail on the probability of the kind of data as a whole, given our models um, later in this talk. So um, now, what kind of models should we have? And in uh, my work, we built by base a lot of it on Gaussian processes because they satisfy a lot of the things we'd like to have from a probabilistic model, which is um, we don't actually know, often we don't know the functional relationship between inputs and outputs directly. And um, we want to learn that, but we also want to be able to quantify our uncertainty about what's happening. And we want to be able to incorporate as much prior knowledge that we have kind of outside the data as well. And while um, deep learning with neural networks is very popular uh, in practice, uh, the kinds of data sets that we uh, end up with are actually quite small and sparse, which is something that Gaussian processes are very good for. We're also looking into making our models more explainable. And last but not least, I think GPs are just fun to work with. So hopefully that's given you some motivation for the rest of the talk. And I'm next going to focus on the F, like what kind of model for a function can we have? So Gaussian processes. Um, before I define what the GP actually is, I'm just going to talk about distributions over functions more generally. And uh, maybe it's easier to get an intuitive understanding of what that means by looking at the weight space. So for example, we can consider a very simple linear regression model, y equals ax plus b. And if we put uh, we can put a prior distribution on those two parameters for the slope A and the intercept B. And then, for example, we could draw samples from the parameters and then plot what does that mean for Y as a function of X. And we get a prior that looks like this. We can also do this with more complex parametric models, for example, Bayesian neural networks. Um, again, we can put priors on the weights and end up with draws from our Bayesian neural network prior that looks like this. But one, one problem with this approach is that it's kind of hard to know what does, what does the prior really mean? Like, sure, we can put different priors on the weights, but what effect does that have on the uh, functions that this kind of induces a distribution over? And the other aspect is that often we don't actually care so much about the parameters we just want to predict. So this kind of motivates uh, integrating, integrating out these uh, 
distributions over the weights. And um, moving towards like a kind of cluster GP, uh, we can also think of a uh, linear model with basis functions. So here there's a handful of basis functions on a line and we can give those priors as well and end up with uh, uh, prior over functions like this. And a Gaussian process is kind of taking this to the limit of infinitely many basis functions. So instead we kind of forget about the basis functions and go straight into a distribution of functions in the function space. And this is defined by, this distribution is defined by two functions. One is the mean function mu and the other is the kernel or covariance function k. And a Gaussian process is, you can kind of think of it as the um, infinite dimensional equivalent of a normal distribution. So um, the mean function relates to the expectation of the function value at some point and the kernel function relates to the covariance between f at one point x and at um, the function value at another point x prime. And why do we why do we use Gaussian processes? It's not because they're particularly complex actually, it's act because they just have a couple of very convenient properties. The first one is that marginals of the Gaussian process at a finite number of points are just multivariate normal distribution. So that just makes it easy to know what to do with if we um, want to look at a finite number of points, which is all that we ever do in practice. And the second one is that conditionals of a Gaussian process are also GP. And the conditional mean and the conditional covariance are given by this very common set of equations. Like if you look at any GP paper, you're probably going to find some variant of this equation. I'm not going to go into too much more detail on the equation side of things. Instead, I want to give you a bit more intuition on what does this kernel function actually mean. So first I'm going to look at a uh, prior GP. And um, when kind of visualizing GPs, uh, a lot of the time people just plot the marginal variance, which I've done here as well, it's the shaded blue band. But that completely ignores all the correlations in the kernel itself, which means that um, it's kind of misleading. Uh, it doesn't actually tell you about the behavior of the functions. Like you could have lots of different kernels that all have the same marginal variance, but actually lead to very different looking functions, which I'll get to in the end. So um, on top of the marginal variance, I've plotted three sample draws in blue, green, and cyan. And to visualize the kind of influence of the kernel function, I've plotted the slice through k of x1 and x2 as a function of x, the second parameter here. And then on the right hand side, um, I visualized the bivariate distribution of the function values f of x1 and f of x2. So you'll note that the green and the cyan sample paths are very close here. So they're also very close both in f of x1 and f of x2. And um, because x1 and x2 are close together, they're highly correlated. So you get a very um, correlated Gaussian here. So um, if you now move x2 away from x1, you can see how the correlation uh, changes and eventually becomes completely uncorrelated and the samples are kind of becoming independent of each other. And this becomes more interesting when, of course, you look at a GP given some observations. So here I've just added one observation in black, which changes both the mean and the kernel. So the kernel I'm plotting slice of here is now the kernel of the posterior GP. And um, you'll note that it can actually become negative where um, on the other side of the data point if we have a small function value here, we actually expect a high function value here because otherwise we would have to have a hard kink here, which is unlikely given this prior. 
And um, so if we just have a Gaussian likelihood, then inference in this model is actually very straightforward. This is just back to basis theorem. And we can do all of this in closed form if our observation model is saying, OK, the y's that we observe are just the function values plus some Gaussian distributed noise. So that's great. We can do everything in closed form. That's what most people think of when they think of Gaussian process regression. And um, the downside is it scales cubically with the number of data points n. Um, and that's because in the conditional um, equation that you saw a few slides before, there's the in in inverse of the kernel matrix. So that's n cubed. And that means this only really works for about a few thousand, uh, few, yeah, few thousand data points on normal machines. So uh, if you want to look at more visualizations of this kind of standard intro to GPs, there's a really nice distilled pub article on the visual explor exploration of Gaussian processes that I would recommend. Um, and that's all I want to say about kind of GP basics. Hope that all makes sense. If there's any quick questions now, let me know. And otherwise, I'm going to move on to making it practical. And um, what's, what's not practical about Gaussian processes? So uh, a lot of people think, oh, Gaussian processes, you just interpolate with Gaussian basis functions and also you have to assume that your noise is Gaussian, so that's not great. And anyways, it doesn't scale to very many data points. So what's the point anyways? And um, I want to basically clear up those misconceptions in the rest of the talk and show how we can do more interesting things for all of those. Um, and first, I want to start talking about how we can have some tons of kernels, which relates to the input domain x. Following that, I'll talk about observation models, which is how can we relate y and the function f. And uh, finally, briefly go through how can we extend this to sparse models that allow us to actually handle bigger data sets. So first on to the input domain. Now, um, you already saw samples from one GP. Here's samples from very different GP priors. So they all have zero mean. Um, and the only difference is the kernel function. And I don't want to go into too much details what these kernels are. I just wanted to show the breadth of, we can have very rough functions or very smooth functions. We can have periodic functions or very erratic functions. And we can have very kind of static functions or very dynamic functions. And these are just base kernels. We can also add them, multiply them, uh, warp them, scale them, and so on. And while these plots are just in 1D, um, those kernels are not restricted to 1D. You can also put them over two-dimensional inputs, for example. So here we have a um, draw from a kernel that induces non-differentiable functions but continues versus one that induces infinitely differentiable functions. And so the kernel actually puts a lot of structure into our model. And um, you might say, oh, but like, that's a bad thing. But really, the space of functions is so, um, so infinitely vast and complex that if you have no structure in there at all, then actually learning anything is really hard. So by constraining the space of functions, uh, that's actually what allows us to learn from a finite small set of observations. Now, GP visualizations are typically in 1D or 2D, but uh, GPs don't just have to be on the, in the, on the real numbers. We can also have GPs on graphs where function inputs are edges uh, or nodes of a graph. We can also have to piece over graphs where the function inputs is a whole graph structure 
we can have GPs over strings or sequences. So um, they're, they're actually applicable to all kinds of data sets. All that you really need is some kind of similarity measure between different points in your input space, because that's basically all that the kernel says. Now, how do you actually choose the kernel? Um, ideally, we would just um, put the hierarchical model over the kernels and um, kind of marginalize over kernels and take all of the kernels into account. And um, the quantity that actually tells us like how much to weigh the different kernels by is the marginal likelihood um, P of Y given the model. And um, that basically gives us an optimization objective to um, either uh, train, for example, length scales of, of a kernel or to compare different kernels and how well they describe the data. And one way of getting a bit better intuition in why the marginal likelihood um, works well for that is to, to write it out as a probability of the individual data points given the model. And we can rewrite this joint probability as a product of conditional distribution. So the probability of the first data point given the model times the probability of the second data point given the first and the model and so on. And um, this you can kind of think of as a variant of leave one out um, cross validation. And there was at the start of this year, a very interesting paper on the marginal likelihood and cross validation, which um, tells you in a lot more detail about this connection between the two. Now, I already talked about the structure that is imposed on the space of functions by the kernel. Next, I want to talk about how we can put even more structure on our functional relationships. So here, you get a lot of draws from a GP prior. So all of these are visualizations of a two-dimensional function with zero mean, um, not the function, the GP has zero mean. And maybe it's a little bit early for snowflakes, but I quite like this visualization um, also because it shows how easy it is to get structure into a GP. And all of these draws have both six-fold rotational symmetry and mirror symmetry, which is the symmetry group of snowflakes. So they all look like snowflakes. Now, you might say, okay, that's pretty, but what's that good for? There's actually a lot of practical applications and I'll just mention two. The first one is um, if you want to build a model over molecules, for example, um, the properties of a molecule shouldn't depend on how it's oriented in space. And also it should be um, invariant under swapping atoms of the same element. So if we can encode this knowledge in our model, then it will have a much easier time to both like learn from um, the finite data that we've got and to generalize to new conformations. And um, so it might just be part of our knowledge about what's actually going on. Um, it also helps to make very high dimensional problems more tractable. So for example, for image inputs, you can build a convolutional kernel for GPs, much like the convolutional layers in neural networks that um, basically constrain the space of functions to make it easier to learn um, anything. Now, how do you actually do that in practice? And for that, I'm going to go to a very simple example, um, which is just kind of mirror symmetry along the diagonal. And this symmetry corresponds to swapping the dimensions of X. And we can construct an invariant function F on this two-dimensional input space um, by taking any arbitrary function G and just taking G of X1 and X2 and add it to G of X2 and X1. And then f of x1, x2 is exactly the same as f of x2 and x1. And this is generalized in the concept of an orbit. 
So the orbit is just the set of all points that are kind of equivalent to um, a point X. So in this example of mirror symmetry, the orbit of the dark red point is the point itself, of course, and its mirror image. And we then construct an invariant function just by summing over this orbit. Now, the convenient thing is that Gaussian processes are closed under uh, linear operations. So if I take a sum of GPs, I get another GP. So I can just put a GP prior of my choice on G with some kernel on this um, input space KG. And then the kernel on F is just given by the covariance of F at X and F at X prime. And because here we assumed the zero mean, we can simply take the expectation of the product of the functionalities at two different points. And that induces then a GP prior on F. So all draws from this GP prior with this kernel with a double sum over the orbits ends up being symmetric under these transformations, uh, sorry, invariant under these transformations. So for the snowflake example, the orbit actually has 12 points. The orbit can also be infinite, for example, if you consider rotational symmetry. And um, that you might say, okay, that's problematic when we have uh, some of the, all these orbit points. Um, and I can't go into too much details here. If you're interested, um, I gave a workshop talk at the Gaussian Process Summer School 2019. That's on YouTube if you want to watch that later. So um, that hopefully gave you um, some interesting things about the input domain. Uh, next up, I want to look at the other side of the functional relationship. What can we um, say about the output domain? What can we um, put into our model on that side? And um, there's two different aspects I want to touch on here. Um, the first one is relating to the closeness of uh, GPs under linear operations. Um, and then the second one is about non uh, likelihoods beyond the Gaussian likelihood. So first, because uh, a derivative of a Gaussian process is also a Gaussian process, we can simply condition on observations of derivatives and same for integrals. So here I'm going to come back to the molecular properties example. So one um, topic I worked on in my PhD was molecular simulations. And to simulate the dynamic behavior of molecules, you need the forces acting on each of the atoms. Now, all the forces have to kind of be consistent with each other because they're all gradients of the same function, which is the energy surface of the molecule. So, um, what, what we did was basically build a model that learns from observations of the forces of a very accurate way of computing the forces between um, atoms and using a Gaussian process to kind of integrate all of those observations in one go and then give us a approximate potential that's still very good, but more importantly, much, much faster than the um, underlying kind of quantum mechanical energy surface. Um, so that's a use case for um, derivative observations in GPs. And we can also look at the other direction. So uh, in some applications, you might only have integral observations. So for example, in tomography, you might only know what's the total absorption between a transmitter and a receiver which kind of corresponds to the line integral of a function modeling kind of the density field um, in this object. And all we can measure is the integral along these cut lines. And again, Gaussian processes give us a way of combining all these observations and solving the inverse problem this way. So both of these examples still assumed you might still assume Gaussian likelihood and you can still do it uh, in closed form, but what if the likelihood isn't Gaussian? And um, might 
most likely it's on Gaussian, right? So um, it could be because you know you have outliers in your data, so you want to do robust regression like with the Stevens T likelihood, or it might be because um, the observations aren't actually uh, continuous numbers. For example, there might just be class labels that you want to do classification on, or you might only know what's the ordering of y values, but not exactly where they are if you have ordinal data, or very relevant in um, the practical applications we look at in terms of forecasting as uh, count data. Lots of times you only have um, kind of positive, positively constrained integral observations. We can also have zero inflated likelihood. So this is, for example, in genetics, where we know from the biological processes that are going on that there's a lot more zeros than non-zero numbers. So if we can put this into our model, then it performs much better. And we can even combine several of these likelihoods in a multi-stage likelihood. And now, none of these allow us to do exact GP regression. So I'm going to go through that at the example of uh, uh, robust regression with some outliers. So if we just have some toy data and a few of the observations are outliers, if we just use a plain GP regression model, then it's going to be very uncertain and be heavily biased by the outliers. If instead we use a student T likelihood, then the model knows how to ignore the outliers and actually gives us a much better and a more confident fit. And um, I'm going to show how we actually um, handle this in practice at a scalar example. So here we just have a Gaussian prior um, corresponding to the GP prior, just at a single point. And now let's say we have an observation at 10 with a student T likelihood, um, looks like that. If we multiply them, uh, then we don't actually have the posterior yet, right? Like to actually get a probability distribution, we need to normalize. And for that, we need to compute the evidence, which is the integral over this. Now in 1D, fortunately, that's very straightforward numerically. So we can renormalize and look at our posterior that's definitely not Gaussian and has a bit of a heavy tail towards zero here. So, okay, we can't compute the exact posterior. What do we do? So um, we can, we've built a model, but now we have to actually make some approximations to be able to uh, actually do anything. There's many different ways of doing approximate inference in these models, apart from Markov chain Monte Carlo and expectation propagation. Uh, one of the key tools that we use is variation inference, and that's the one that I'm going to focus on here. So if you know variational inference already, then you might know what's coming now. And if not, I hope this gives you a bit of an intuition of what variational inference is about. So let's picture a space of all distributions, including the exact posterior that is not tractable. So we don't actually know where it lives in this space. So instead, we're going to say, okay, let's take a subset of this space of distributions and just look at those that are kind of nice. And by nice, we mean we know how to handle it, we know its properties. So this might be a multivariate normal distribution. And um, we can parameterize these distributions. Um, and for example, for multivariate normal distribution, the parameters might be the mean and the covariance matrix of uh, this approximate posterior distribution Q of theta. The second ingredient we need is some kind of distance between distributions. And one example, not the only one, but the one that I'm going to focus on in this talk is the kullback leipler divergence between the two. And once we've got this, we can try and find that um, approximate posterior that's closest under this distance measure to the exact posterior. Um, and 
in uh, our use cases. So in some cases, you can do that, find the optimal approximate posterior in closed form. But uh, we typically just use gradient-based optimization to minimize this distance. And you end up with an optimized approximate posterior. And instead of the exact posterior, we can now use this Q of theta for predicting. So that's definitely an assumption and an approximation. But um, if, if this distribution set of nice distributions isn't big enough, then we know, OK, we've still got the same model. We can now look at how can we increase the size of this set to get better approximations. All right, so now we introduce this Q of theta. And uh, I mentioned that we use for distance the Kullback Leibler divergence, which is just the expectation under the approximate posterior of the log fraction between the approximate and the true posterior. And we want to minimize this. So the KL0 when Q of theta is exactly the same as the true posterior. Um, now, we don't actually know what the true posterior is, right? But we can use basis theorem after we write, write out the log. And we can use basis theorem to split the posterior into the prior, the likelihood, and the evidence. The evidence we still can't compute, but it's actually not a function of the of theta. So it comes outside the integral, and it doesn't depend on um, the parameters of the approximate posterior. So it's irrelevant when it comes to finding the best posterior. There's one different way of looking at it. And for that, we just have to note that this as the KL divergence is always a positive number. So we can move the log evidence to the other side. And then on the left-hand side here, we just have the negative of this bit, and this is now a lower bound on the log evidence and also shortened as just elbow. So on the next slide, I'm showing you how we actually optimize this for our toy example. We start out by putting our approximation on top of the prior, which was also a Gaussian. And this is the non-Gaussian posterior that we're trying to find. So we're starting out somewhere in this parameter space that in this scalar case is two-dimensional. One is the mean of our approximate posterior and the other one is the um, kind of variance of our approximate posterior. And this is the optimization surface, uh, the objective surface in this very simple example. So we can now take a gradient step towards the maximum of this elbow and it goes up and the approximate posterior moves a little bit towards the true posterior. Now, this is the scalar case. What do we do for Gaussian processes? Uh, a lot of this carries over. Again, we have a GP prior. We often make the assumption that the likelihood factorizes over data points, which makes um, makes the computations more efficient. Um, again, this is kind of a modeling assumption. If this doesn't actually hold, then you have to go back and revisit your model. And how do we replace the approximate posterior in the scalar case? Well, um, in analogy to the scalar case, we just use another GP. And in principle, we could use any way of um, parameterizing mu and v. But for v to be a valid kernel function, it has to be positive semi-definite. And one way of achieving that is by uh, thinking about, OK, for computing the data fit, we really just need the distribution over f at the data points. So let's split our prior up into a conditional, given uh, the function values at our training data, and then split the prior over f at those points out. And so the prior on uh, bold f is just a zero mean Gaussian with the kernel matrix here. And to then get an approximate posterior, we just replace p of f over here with the p of f. That's now a 
fully parametrized Gaussian distribution. And on the next slide, I want to show you uh, how varying those uh, approximate posterior parameters changes the induced distribution over the GP everywhere. So this is for the covariance, just changing um, how they correlate and what's the marginal variance. And we can also change the mean and thereby uh, get a very flexible distribution that allows us to fit um, function even if the likelihood isn't Gaussian. So that was about the output domain and the observation model. Um, hope that all made sense. If you have any questions at this point, let me know. And if not, I'm going to move on to data set size. How can we actually scale GPs to larger data sets? And for this, um, people started thinking about, OK, um, if we have lots of data points, probably some of them are redundant. So the very first attempts at scaling GPs were basically just throwing away some of the data. Um, and if you look at the historic papers, they tend to be quite confusing. But um, actually thinking about how can we build a sparse model that kind of summarizes the data sets and allows us to train on much larger data sets than the few thousand data points of classic GP regression is by just going back to the variational GP that we just saw. And now the crucial idea was basically to just say, OK, um, here we condition on the function values at the training points. But we don't actually have to choose that. Instead, we could also just pick some arbitrary other set of points, z, um, z. And we just say, OK, we condition on the function values at those inducing points having some value u. And so this combination of u and z is called inducing variable. And um, just as in the BGP case where we condition on f at x, um, overall, this gives us the exact prior as before. And for our approximate posterior, we just replace the prior distribution on u with some arbitrarily parametrized u of u. And this gives us an even more flexible distribution than before because we can also change the locations of z. And um, this now allows us to scale to larger data sets by just saying like, OK, um, instead of having n data points, let's take a much smaller number than that of inducing points. So we're kind of summarizing the full data sets in these pseudo observations at some arbitrarily uh, arbitrarily chosen inducing point set. And now this reduces the computational scaling of um, the GP conditionals from n cubed to nm squared plus m cubed. Um, has another really nice advantage. So now we've actually decoupled our approximate posterior from the data points. In the previous variational GP case, the posterior still depended on the training data, but now it doesn't. So that allows us to do mini batching and use stochastic optimization, which then scales to millions of data points. And um, this was introduced in the Gaussian processes for big data paper. Now, you might say, OK, but if we have lots of data points, doesn't that mean that the number of inducing points also has to keep growing? And it's a very valid question. I um, am glad someone else actually showed that that's not true. So in a paper from last year, Bert all proved that under some reasonable assumptions, the number of inducing points that you need for convergence only scales logarithmically with your size of the data set. Um, so that gives us a reasonable foundation for believing that this model approximation is valid 
even for very large data sets. And um, we can further improve the efficiency of our inference by realizing that we don't just have to use inducing points where we say our inducing variable u is given by a function evaluated at inducing locations, but much as we could have uh, derivative and integral observations to condition the GP on, we can choose any linear operator A and um, condition the GP approximate posterior on this linear operator applied to our function. So this helps uh, in reducing the scaling. So if you think back to the um, invariances example, where you had the double sum in the kernel by making use of interdomain approximations, we can actually get rid of that double sum. And um, we can even use this, for example, one of my colleagues um, this year published work on circle harmonic features, which turned the kernel matrix on these inducing variables into a diagonal matrix, which means that instead of a cubic cost for inverting it, it's only linear in the number of inducing points. So this was a very quick run through uh, a bunch of different aspects around making GPs more scalable. Um, I'm nearly at the end of the talk and I just want to go through a case study on a customer project that we had where we made use of some of these features. So this has palettes, a lot of very blue palettes and they're used by a palette pooling business um, that sends them to manufacturers. The manufacturers put their goods on the pallets, then send them off to various retailers. And once the retailers have sold the goods on the pallets, the pallets are empty again, um, a pallet pooling business comes and picks them up, refurbishes them or repairs them as needed and returns them to the manufacturers. And so it goes in this loop. Now, the problem was the pallet pooling business doesn't actually know what the stock levels of empty pallets at the retailers are. Um, they know that the stock levels are increasing over time because the retailers keep getting goods sent from the manufacturers, but they don't know how many they have. So stock, they very occasionally do stock, stock counts, but it's very, very expensive to figure out, um, to get the retailers to actually count the pallets that they have waiting for a pickup. And moreover, um, when they send a truck to a retailer, the truck either picks up a full truck load of pallets and takes them back to the service center, or if it doesn't find enough pallets, it just says, okay, I'm just gonna turn around and move on to the next retailer. So the only observations they have on stock levels at an individual retailer is either the collection was successful, then afterwards it's going to uh, reduce by this much, or it was a failed collection, so it means um, it can't have been more than this many pallets. And um, yes, and then if we don't collect anything, then the uh, stock levels are going to increase with some unknown rate, so we kind of want a function that goes through these observations. And that is actually what we did. So we had a kind of variant on a um, kind of classification likelihood for uh, count observations that says, okay, it was less than this or it was more than this. That takes into account the rate and then finds our best belief over what the stock levels are over time. Now, after today, you see that they're all uh, indefinitely increasing, that's because the um, probabilistic model has only seen the collections here. So after today, it's like, well, if you don't collect anything, the stock levels are just going to rise and rise. And we can bring this back to decision making by now considering, okay, at what locations should we, uh, at what points in time should we optimally place the collections so that we minimize the number of failed collections because there wasn't enough stock level and also minimize the amount of 
stock level so that um, you don't just lose the pallets to being stuck in um, retailer warehouses. So with that, I'm already at the end of my talk. So just to summarize, I hope I've convinced you that Gaussian processes are more interesting than uh, what you might hear in the intro to machine learning lecture. Um, we talked about input domains and what we can do with kernels there. I talked about the output domain and various different observation models that we can um, use with GPs and hopefully I've convinced you that they're actually useful for real world applications. There is a lot more that I did not have any time to talk about that we are also uh, very interested in and doing research on um, in our company. So that includes state space models that allow us to actually do exact linear time inference for GPs of one dimensional inputs. Uh, multi output models, if you want to read through a kind of more tutorial level introduction at the start of this year, we put a paper, a report on archive called the framework for interdomain and multi output Gaussian processes. Um, more another thing we didn't talk about here was latent variable models and we can also build deep Gaussian processes with several layers. So um, if you have any questions now, I'd be very happy to chat. Um, if you realize tomorrow, oh, I've got some questions, you can contact me on email. I'm on Twitter, though I haven't actually tweeted very much. And you can also find me on the GPFlow Slack. GPFlow is a open source toolbox for Gaussian process modeling based on top of TensorFlow that we are contributing to. And we've also recently released a sister project for Bayesian optimization. And the, our research efforts are grouped under what's called Second Mind Labs. And we also offer student research placements, not just around Gaussian processes. So if you're interested in that, get in touch and let me know. Thank you.